Welcome to this Talking Climate podcast produced by the Green Living Centre, an initiative of Inner West Council for Footprints Online. To begin with, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which this podcast was produced, the Gadigal and Wongal peoples of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and future. I extend this to the lands where we are recording and where people are listening from. This is, and always will be, Aboriginal land. So today's podcast, we are talking about climate. And in May 2019, Inner West Council declared a climate emergency and then adopted a climate and renewable strategy to assist the Inner West to respond to the climate emergency. The strategy commits Council to taking more action and places climate at the centre of all decision making. It also focuses on supporting the people of the Inner West to live a more low carbon lifestyle by reducing their carbon emissions through a range of activities such as walking and cycling, taking up renewable energy and growing food locally. Today we are joined by three incredible people who understand the issue of climate change and are open to having a conversation about how to talk to each other about it, why it matters, what some of the barriers to the action are and offer us some practical solutions. So joining us are Rebecca Huntley. Rebecca is one of Australia's foremost researchers on social trends and the author of the recently published How to Talk About Climate Change in a Way That Makes a Difference. Welcome, Rebecca. Very happy to be here, thanks. Also with us is Jean Hinchliffe. Jean is a 16-year-old student and a lead national organiser with School Strike for Climate, campaigning for Australia to become fully carbon neutral. Welcome, Jean. Thanks for having me. And to lead the conversation is ABC journalist and presenter of the podcast, Hot Mess, Richard Aidey. Welcome, Richard, and over to you. Thanks very much, Emma. So Hot Mess was a series we did for Radio National earlier this year, and it really addressed why we've done so little about climate change. And it looked at things like our psychology, the roles of the fossil fuel industries and think tanks, and the key role of government. But in the last episode, we looked at why this might now be changing. And today, that's what we're focusing on, that possibility of change. That's not to say that it's easy, it's not, but it can be done, it is being done. But it's a bit like what the novelist William Gibson said about the future. It's already here, it's just not evenly distributed. That's where we are with climate change. So I'm gonna ask questions of these two people who've thought about this a lot. And Rebecca, I'm gonna start with you. Why hasn't all the information and and the dire warnings from climate scientists, which have been coming for 30 years, landed more effectively with more people? Well, there's lots of reasons, I think. I think the first one is that we have to remember that people don't always respond to facts. Um, Everybody who ever takes up smoking or ever drink drives or ever does, you know, eats a terrible diet or any of those other things, you know, we human beings constantly make decisions based on a combination of rational and irrational input. But I think that's particularly true for climate change, because instead of just being about a health warning, it's about, you know, some complicated scientific facts that that well, even though some of us are across them, you know, not necessarily everybody understands. And when we think about who is who delivering, who are delivering those facts, um, scientists, some of whom can be excellent communicators, some of whom can't necessarily be great communicators. So we've got a we've got a really um, we've got a, a an issue with messengers. But more than anything, the reality of climate change is profoundly confronting. It's confronting no matter where you sit in our society, but it can particularly be confronting for people like us in Australia who live quite affluent lives, who live in an economy that is somewhat reliant on um, fossil fuels, particularly in terms of domestic energy production, but also export. And, and, you know, it's a very, it feels very much like that parable, you know, the sky is falling, and we, there's so many things in our, in our mind and so many things in our society that force us to resist the full implications of the climate message. So it's actually a wonder that most of us, that any of us think about it at all, I've got to say, <laughs> given how many barriers there are um, to us fully engaging with it. 
I remember reading that, I mean, we are the only being on earth that understands that we're going to die. And one of the ways that we deal with that is that we don't think about it at all. Is, is it part of that is what's going on here? Well, look, it's it's more profound than that, I think. I think, yes, there's been quite a bit of research done on this notion of of denial of mortality. Is that the at the at the core of why we resist climate change? But, you know, you're right, human beings do not think about death all the time. But so much of our culture and society is set up to find a way to rationalise knowing that we will die. So that's at the centre of religion. It's the centre of so much of of, um, philosophy and everything else. So we have cognitive techniques to deal with our own death. But but climate change is more profound than, than focusing on our own mortality because, for me, I know that I'm going to die. It's not a very kind of um, pleasant thing to think about. But I think about the legacy, about what I leave behind, that my death makes a a way for my children and potentially my grandchildren. And I think about the little mark that I might leave on the world. Climate change is more than that. Climate change is the death of everything. And so no wonder we resist thinking about it even more than we resist thinking about our own deaths. I'll come back to this, the messages that have been used not as successfully as we'd like and and in fact the framework that those messages have sat in but i want to bring jean in because jean you have gone out and and done something what what was the moment that kind of got you started on this Mm. it's really hard to say because i think this experience rings true for a lot of young people in that the climate crisis and the fact that climate change is happening has been an inherent fact from quite a young age. I mean, I learned about it, I'd hear about it in the news, I knew it was a major problem, but it took me a really long time to recognise just how bad it is and the fact that nothing was being done about it. Because I I knew that it was a problem, but I, I assumed that, you know, we have all these politicians in charge and we have these scientists researching it and someone's going to figure it out, you know, they, all the responsible adults in charge have to be able to figure this out. And then I it reached this point when um, I was in year nine and the UN report, which gave us a deadline of 12 years to avert the worst impacts of the climate crisis, that I realised that people weren't solving this problem and that I had to do something. And I almost felt this responsibility to take action because it was so enormous and that this sort of insurmountable issue and it was as if if I didn't take action who would so yeah it, it did take quite a bit of time but I think even then it's hard to say the exact moment where I felt I had to do something because even then the entire time I knew that this was a problem everything everyone had to do something about I remember that that report from the UN I think we're talking towards the end of uh, what 2018 yeah, that's the one. And it was big news, but but you took it personally. <laughs> I did. Um, at the time, I was I was fourteen, and twelve years after that, I'm going to be twenty six, and it felt like there was this deadline on my future, and and I'd be reading about all the impacts that would be happening because of it, and it it, it was enormous. But then I looked at on a global scale, the people who are already being impacted now, and it's it's typically areas, um, low-lying Pacific regions, um, areas that are polluting the least, that are going to be impacted the most, and and the human death toll of that, and and just this enormous thing that changes life as we know it, it it, it was just this insane issue, like, it's crazy, it's so hard to think about. In in your book, Rebecca, you say... Green Girls, like Jean, were instrumental in triggering your change of heart. And, and I want to get onto that in a minute because you said what you went on to ask what motivates them. So, Jean, do you, do you know what motivates you? I think that there are a few things because um, I know a lot of people who are activists and that they've always been naturalists and they have a really strong connection with na- nature and I'm the sort of person like I'm a city girl and I it's not something I really even think about that much but for me it's the fact that this is it feels like the biggest issue humanity has ever faced and it's hard to not be motivated about it and it's hard to not care because it's not that I have this inherent personal reason it's that 
I'm trying to save the world here. <laughs> like, it's it's so hard to grasp, like I was saying, and it's not just another issue and it's not just a thing I'm passionate about. It is life as we know it, trying to save that and trying to save the lives of so many and trying to alter the world in a way that is sustainable and livable. Rebecca, that, that change of heart that you've written about and spoken about, what happened? Oh, well, I, I watched people like Jean. <laughs> um, on the streets of Sydney, but also all around the world, um, young men and women, not much older than my eldest daughter, really saying, you know, quite clearly, what's the point in going to school, brushing our teeth, doing all the things that adults tell them to do, if we emerge into a world as adults, to an unlivable world or into a world which is barely livable. So it's, you know, as, as the parent generation, as adults, we really can't expect to be listened to about all those other things we tell young people, work hard, study hard, stay in school, all the things that we lecture young people about if we can't possibly create a safe and secure world for them to emerge into. So I think, I, you know, Jean talks about a sense of responsibility. Um, that was the same sense thing that I felt as well. And I suppose I felt both a sense of personal responsibility as a parent, but also a bit of professional responsibility. And this is where the, you know, Jean's comment about it being the biggest issue that faces humanity, I think that's right. But it's also been the biggest, you know, and this might sound, I'm sounding rather arrogant, but I thought, oh, well, this is the biggest professional challenge I've ever faced, you know. So how do we, how as a researcher, do I accurately measure how people feel about climate change? And how as somebody who works with a lot of different organisations to refine messages and advocacy and tactics um how do i how do i do that like how do we crack this nut of getting people to act on climate change which is something that people have been trying for some time with some success but nowhere near the success that we need to avert the kind of um the kind of really crisis that's coming down the line i, I know what you mean about responding as a parent because Although I've been thinking about this and worrying about it and getting wound up and shouting at the radio and the television for <laughs> decades, it's my daughter who's pretty much Jean's age, now in year 11, when she started talking to me about it, it did kick me up a level. And around the same time, I read John Lanchester's novel, The War, which I don't know if anyone else has read it, but it's basically in a future where something terrible has happened and it's, it's climate related. And the, par the parental generation, they're kind of shunned by the younger people because they didn't do enough. And I really thought about that. And I'll come back to what will make a difference in terms of acting in a minute. But Jean, I, I wanna go back again to just beyond that time you were talking about before the UN report has come out. You're in year nine, you're getting towards the end of year nine. When I was in year nine, I was not very focused on anything much beyond me and the people I knew. <laughs> How did you become the person who organised the first strike for climate in Sydney? The thing about this story is that my intention wasn't to be the person who was organising the whole thing. Um, I'd heard a bit about School Strike. I've sent, a friend had sent me a link to um, their newly formed website and there was I saw that there was an event being planned in Melbourne. So... I sent an email out right away and I said how if there's going to be something happening in Sydney, I'd love to help out or I'd love to be part of it somehow. And they responded back saying, oh, we'd love to help you achieve this goal. And suddenly I had this, this oh crap moment of, oh, this, this isn't what I was trying to sign up for. Like, this is a lot of responsibility and I don't know how to go about doing this whatsoever because... I'd had some experience in activism before. I'd done phone banking with the Yes campaign and I'd been a bit active with Stop Adani, but nothing on that scale. So I just kind of rolled with it. And I remember later that evening, I was with my family and we'd just finished having dinner and I, I got up a Google Doc and started typing ideas of, okay, where can we hold a protest and how do you hold a protest even at that? Um, and very luckily, we had a lot of great support from the Australian Youth Climate Coalition and also Tipping Point and Stop Adani, who sort of were able to mentor us and show us sort of 
show us the ropes. Um, but yeah, it just sort of somehow came together. And I remember on the day just thinking about it and realizing that I, I had never really, even though I was planning it and even though I was like putting up posters and I was talking to media and I was getting other young people involved, I never actually expected it to come together. Mm. <laughs> like it, it seemed like this weird intangible thing that that wasn't actually going to come to fruition and, and then it did and it was enormous and it was just <laughs> fantastic you know and yeah it, it, it is just the most surreal experience you you actually got a bit of um probably unwitting help on on his part because scott morrison actually said something that made a difference oh totally <laughs> the thing i love this because um we had been getting a bit of attention in the lead up to the strike. We'd had a bit of media. Um, we knew that maybe if we did really well in Sydney, we might be having a thousand people that was looking more like a few hundred. Um, and then during question time, uh, Scott Morrison was asked what he thought of the strikes. And he had that, that infamous quote that um, kids should be in school and that um, we need more learning in schools and less activism and really, really sort of said how much he disproved of it and nothing mobilised kids like that because we saw that and we saw a politician again sweeping this issue under the rug and, and <laughs> acting like our opinions weren't valid and that our voices shouldn't be listened to. And we were mad. We were pissed off. And that's what made kids come to the street. And suddenly, like, I remember that day or the day after, um, we'd been flooded with international media requests and it was blowing up. And I think that, um, yeah, it's just fantastic to think that ScoMo's comment had that impact, um, mm. particularly considering that Australia was one of the first countries to really popularise climate striking on that large scale. It really sort of got the ball rolling for the rest of the world. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Morrison. Uh, that, that is, there's a couple of things about that. As you tell it, it's a great story. It really is. And also you talk about the emotion. We got mad. Rebecca, this, this gets right into the kind of the meat of, of the book, doesn't it? And you talk about the critical role of stories in making climate change seem relevant and, and less overwhelming. I think that's right, which is why it's not just kind of narcissism that means that I start the book off with the story of watching the kids climate strike because I you know in in a in an area which can be extraordinarily overwhelming in terms of it can you know to really immerse yourself in the climate science it really invites despair and what I really what I really like is that you know Jean tells a story about getting involved which was a bit more you know got it Got a got bit more bit more involved than she intended to, but you know the things motivated her, and she got suddenly involved, and then something else happened, and it got bigger. And then even though I I didn't wasn't able to go to the, the climate strikes, they mo they they really did take me from being somebody who was generally concerned about climate change to somebody who has now decided to commit her professional life to it. So they're these really interesting overlapping stories, which are those of interconnected engagement hope and support so i've never met jean but the work of her and her and her peers um has you know changed the direction of my my professional life and so the, you can imagine if you scale this up and this is why it's so critical for people to get involved and to talk is that this is actually how we make things change and so one of the things that i found really interesting is that i've met other parents and other adults who've been mobilised by the children's strike. Other people have come to climate through the recent fires that we've had. It kind of can be anything, that kind of aha moment for people. But what is really interesting is that going into writing about our emotional response to climate change, I went in with a very kind of the usual kind of not very helpful, um, you know, uh, Afro, you know, kind of statement that, you know, when talking about climate change, you have to, it's always got to be positive, positive emotions, but really flashes of collective constructive anger and frustration, which is what the kids' climate strike was um, and, and will continue to be, what were really, really important, really important because it shows to other people, particularly people who are perhaps silently frustrated and worried that they're not alone. 
And it also means the people who are involved in those strikes feel a greater sense of empowerment being with other people. And so they actually are incredibly important. They're an important part of shifting people's perceptions. I, I wouldn't suggest that they have climate strikes every week and I wouldn't necessarily suggest to Jean and any of her friends that they go crazy and tip over cars and set them alight or any of those <laughs> other kinds of things. I'm not suggesting violence. Don't do that, Jean. <laughs> absolutely, don't you? And, and don't get angry at me telling you not to do it. Well, your mother's there. She knows that. that so I'm sure she tells you not to do those things as well. But, but no great, you know, no fun fundamental shift in society has ever been brought about without moments of collective frustration and anger expressed, you know, in things like protests and strikes, and they're absolutely fundamental. We have to get emotional. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because we're all taught, and, and Jean, you'll be in the middle of this, this whole debating thing, where you lay out your argument, and it's all very logical, it's not just rational, it's logical. You build on that bit and then the next bit and then the next speaker takes it to the next stage and your third speaker does the summing up. And although there's a little bit of room in there, perhaps for humour, um, we're not taught to engage emotionally and yet this is all about engaging emotionally. Jean. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I, I totally agree. I think that... um. It's interesting because I think also when you're not regarding emotion, it's easier to ignore things and it's easier to put things off. And it, it sort of needs a combination of both somehow in that we need to look at things objectively and we need to view the science, of course. But also in order for people to care and in order for people to see the reason why we need to make a change and why we need to make a difference, you need to be communicating with the heart and you need to be creating this emotional response because the fact of the matter is that this is changing people's lives and this is robbing young people of their future and all future generations of, of their lives and it's robbing people currently of their well-being and it's it's changing the world in this incredibly dramatic way and if we're looking at it just as sort of another statistic or numbers on a page it's easy to ignore and it's easier to pretend that it's not really happening or it won't impact me or it's just impacting some people. Whereas when you can shift that dialogue and when you're centering young voices and frontline voices, suddenly people feel this emotional connection and they understand why it is so important to take action and to make that difference. Uh, I'm, I'm struck by, um, and I think I said this in the series, that you and uh, the other young people around the world who've led us on this, have a moral clarity that grown-ups have kind of got past, but it's a very compelling thing to witness and it reminds all of the adults that they used to feel that strongly about things, they used to feel that hopeful and that angry and perhaps that frightened, and that power engages the parents as well. But, Rebecca, I want to talk about stories because we've kind of touched on it, but it seems to me they're the kind of um, not secret weapon the sort of special source that we need if people are going to care more. All the, all the reports from the UN in the world aren't going to make the difference that compelling stories are going to make. Compelling stories are essential and particularly diverse stories. So, you know, I recognise that the story that I tell about climate change might um, be something that is relatable and relevant to somebody who um, maybe knows me or... Um, for, you know, kind of maybe sees themselves in me and in that we have similar lives, but it, it may not be motivating for somebody else. So we, we do need lots and lots of different kinds of stories so that people can find a way to connect climate change to their life and find their own path to the issue. So the, the thing that is also really interesting as well, and I think this is the way the role of creative, uh, you know, the creative arts and people who write fiction can play a really important role as well. So when we think about, you know, what are the kinds of, you know, there's there's plenty of what is described as collapse porn around, <laughs> which is basically, and you were talking a bit about it, which is basically, you know, projecting towards, a, you know, a world in which um, the environment is so deteriorated and our society around it that we're all kind of, you know, we're not just haggling in the streets, in, in the supermarkets for toilet paper, we're doing probably far worse than that. But I think that one of the things that, that 
creative storytelling can do is show us a, a path towards a livable world, the kinds of societies we need to build to that are resilient and still connected, that can still hold all members of society as we head towards what is going to be, no matter what we do, inevitable environmental um, damage and disruption. So I think that stories that we tell about how we've come to an aha moment about climate change are important, but broader creative stories about well, what is a realistic future where we still have a livable world, where we still retain the things that we value, where not all is lost and where are the, the good parts of our human nature are um, the ones that are ascendant and um, aren't, you know, completely subsumed by the desire to hoard, kill and do all those other kinds of things that can happen in societies that are put under immense pressure. <sighs> Jean, I'm, I, I'm, I'm wondering just a bit more about these stories. And I, I, I don't expect you use stories of hoarding or killing when you're talking about this to other people. But are you, one of the things that's in Rebecca's book is about getting that issue of climate change into everyday conversations. Now, you're in year 11, you've got a lot on, you've got less than a term before year 12 starts, I don't have to tell you. Oh, don't remind but, me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, well, my daughter's in exactly the same place. Do you, are you still doing this apart from, you know, when you were holding these large scale events? And of course, the pandemic has meant that it had to become a, a virtual digital thing. Are you still talking about this every day? Yeah, I know that I personally am a lot. I think it's something that um, I get really worried about, particularly considering that we're in this pandemic, which is a crisis in itself. And then we sort of have this other crisis, the, the climate crisis going on in the background, and it's certainly not slowing down. So um, I think that whilst in my own personal experience, I've kept it up, it, it's hard for a lot of people to continue prioritizing both. And yeah, I, I think that it's, it's a point of worry in me that people aren't discussing it enough anymore. And it's not being valued enough, because just because we're in another crisis doesn't mean that this crisis has stopped. And I, I see that particularly in the, the government sort of leading a gas-led recovery and, and the fact that we've kind of put this on the back burner. So I do worry that um, others aren't able to keep this dialogue up enough, but I also think that that's a sort of societal thing and we need to continue discussing this and doing all that we can as individuals and sort of let that grow. Mm. I'm glad you mentioned the government Rebecca, I'm, one of the things I'm struck by is that politicians, unless they're overtly populist, don't cultivate the emotional, the thing we were just talking about. They're much more likely to frame things as reasonable and rational and necessary. And that sets up the discourse in a way that works for them. How do you, how do you deal with that? Oh, it's a very good point because... <laughs> It's a very good point because often politicians can say they're being reasonable and rational and whilst absolutely not being reasonable and rational. So I mean one of the one of the the interesting things that happens in the in the some of the political discussion around climate change is oh look we we need to take a balanced view to the climate change issue. So we need to have all views represented on climate change. And it's like, well that's actually not balanced or reasonable at all. Um, we don't spend ages talking about uh, you know having people who don't think that gravity exists or don't think the world is round. <laughs> so there's that. So whenever you try and I'm very, very, very concerned when, when a politician says they're going to be reasonable and rational about something. But of course, the other thing that happens here as well, and you hear, and and this is certainly a, a view that's um, held by people in the community, is when you start to make arguments about, you know, the need for an extreme, you know, a rapid um, move away from fossil fuels to renewable energy as quickly as possible. Um, and that involves some disruption, but nothing compared to the disruption that will happen down the track. And, you know, as Jean and everybody on this, you know, podcast knows, that technology around renewables, you know, is the one thing that makes me extraordinarily optimistic and excited. Mm. It's just, it is there in a way that it wasn't when we were having this conversation 15 years ago, or 20 years ago. 
So the, the pathway is there. But when people say, oh, look, we need to be reasonable about it, we need to still, we need to think about nuclear and we need to think about, you know, the, as Jean said, or gas-led recovery, there's absolutely nothing reasonable about that. In fact, anybody who's ever looked at the viability of nuclear energy in Australia would know that it's completely not reasonable. It's just absolutely not an option. So we do, so it is very difficult to continuously and quite exhausting to continuously call out our politicians who say that they're being balanced, rational and reasonable on climate change, whereas, in fact, all they're doing is basically, we don't want to say politicians lie, all they're doing is a, it's a complete and utter misrepresentation of where we are and what our options are. And, and it takes an enormous amount of time and energy <laughs> to continuously call them out on that and it's not done enough, but we need to, we need to all start doing it. I would like to see the business community who know the truth, many of whom outside the fossil fuel industry know the truth about this, begin to, to call uh, politicians bluff on all of these mm. issues, including things like oh, moving to renewables quickly will destroy the economy. These are, these are just, these are things that are not true. If that was true, then you wouldn't have the world's biggest um, investor group, BlackRock, um, make the kinds of statements they have about the kinds of investments they're going to make from this point on about renewable energies. You wouldn't have First State Super, one of the biggest super industries in Australia, making similar kinds of commitments. These are these are organisations run by people with a lot of spreadsheets, really hardcore nerds who don't give a <laughs> really do not give a damn about climate, but are making really rational yeah. decisions about what we need to do. It's actually one of the reasons why I came out of it with some hope because th this is motivated by making money and some of the smartest people in the world do not think that there is money to be made in fossil fuels, not over the long term, that there's money to be made in getting out of it. But I want to go back to, to this idea of the way that politicians kind of frame the discourse to suit them. They kind of set up the rules of grammar and this is how we do it. I, I just wonder if, Jean, do you think because of your youth, and, and the youth of the movement that you're part of, that that means that you, you can kind of go, you know what, we don't have to engage in the way that, that you're mapping this out. You're, you, you're not constrained in the way that adults are. Mm, I totally agree. I, I think that the fact that we're all new to this and we're, we're making our own rules and we're making our form of protest and we're sort of creating our own platform and we're, we're forcing people to value our voices and listen to us, we are able to make the rules in how we're communicating this message and how we're discussing it. And I think that um, language has shifted so much over the past few years. You can see things in um, the climate crisis and climate emergency being used and sort of that, that language transformation from just another issue to a crisis and, and something that we need to take action against um, has been a, a big shift. But I, I think that young people, the, the way that we discuss it together and, and the way that will sort of communicate these issues is, is that um, we see it for the crisis that this is and we see it as our future is being taken and, and we see that this is scary and frightening and we're not okay with it being written off as another issue or something we'll figure out at some point or, or that we're overreacting or that this is needless anxiety. I, I think that the fact that we are so young and that we feel like we're fighting for our lives and for our futures means that we're able to shape this in, in the way that we, we want to and, frankly, in the way that is most accurate. How do we, Rebecca, how do we navigate that that difference between scary and frightening, which is obviously very motivating for Jean and, and, and the remarkable group of young people who have been behind this, and and the fact that scary and frightening is very confronting, as we've already touched on. If we're going to hope that it's emotions that get people to do things. Scary and frightening is is sort of necessary but not sufficient. Yeah, absolutely. And actually listening to Jean, one of the things that really struck me about the, the students' climate strike and, and really about a lot of um, protests now is that they, they can have really funny signs. I know this <laughs> I know this sounds like a weird thing to say. I agree. But they are actually brilliant. I think they are brilliant. And and <laughs> I I mean it really was when I was watching the climate strike, watching all these funny signs and laughing and everything. And it was really in that kind of disarming moment. And also I kind of 
was looking at all these faces, not again, could have been, you know, in the peer group of my do- of my eldest daughter. And, you know, never discount the disarming but extraordinary impact of the combination of, of dark humour, of humour that is actually based on a central truth. So, look, I, I've spent a lot of the book working out um, looking at the psychological studies, looking at the um, research that's done on this about how you how you talk about fear and loss and how you combine that with a message that is not going to make people turn away and curl up in a ball, but realise, okay, resolute, a kind of resolute decision to kind of do something about it. It is Pollyanna-ish not to, not to give people a sense of what's at stake. And, and what can be lost. But it has to be balanced with what can be achieved and what can be gained. Now, it's not a very precise... I can't tell you that it's kind of one part fear now and then say this thing and then do this thing. There's no kind of, or unfortunately, automatic um, equation for this. This is why we spend so much time um, testing messages and try and work out what messages work with which groups under what conditions on what, on what issues. But, I mean, going through it, I realised that we do need to find a way to talk about what can be lost if we don't act because people don't act if they don't think something's at stake. Now, that's not the same as terrifying people with every single scenario of what could go wrong. If you you would like to do that, read The Uninhabitable Earth. That will be sufficient. But if but for me, my whole career now is about trying to focus on the people that say they believe climate change is happening and they're concerned but are not doing anything about it. And those are the people I know are going to turn away from a complete fire and brimstone notion of what's going to happen in the next 10 to 12 years. But they do understand that something's at stake. So how do we get them to act off, off the basis of that? When I um, first proposed Hot Mess, I felt very positive about the prospect of change and and Jean as you've already said right now it seems like the the federal government is using the cover of the pandemic to to lock us into gas in particular are you I've interviewed you before of course only a few months ago and you're still optimistic Are, are you still as optimistic now that we can do these things that you and Rebecca have been talking about over the last little while Well, I think that if I didn't believe that we truly could avert this crisis and and get out of this situation, there'd be no point fighting, you know? um, You have to have an amount of hope and you have to believe in the cause and believe in people power and believe that, well, frankly, the solutions are there and it's hard, but it's something that we will be able to do. And I think that if I wasn't believing in that, I wouldn't have that drive to take action because it just feels so meaningless. And then, you know, you, you have to be an optimist and, well, frankly, a realist. You have to look at this and say, look, at this is hard. It's not looking good. Like, it, it is a scary situation. But unless we believe in this solution and unless we believe in our potential, it's only going to get worse. And, you know, like it's only going to get worse and there is no hope without that belief. Rebecca, what does that make you think about when she says that? Look, it makes me think, and I think this all the time, particularly when I meet friends of mine who are a bit on the doomer spectrum of it all, <laughs> yeah. and I say, well, look, who are, who are almost a bit condescending that I'm trying, you know. Oh, isn't that, you know, haven't you read the science? <laughs> Don't you know we're all... And I say to them, Rebecca, so cute. Yeah, how cute are you that you still think that this is something that's salvageable? Um, so what I say to them is I say, look, I, I have a moral obligation not to give up hope. And most of the activists that I interviewed for the book, they understand the science, they understand the trajectory, they have moments of despair, but they recognise that by staying engaged, they're doing something about the odds, right? And so, uh, and, and this is not my metaphor, I wish it was, but there's a, one of um, my friends in the movement uses the metaphor of the hobbits at the beginning of um, Lord of the Rings. You know, you look at them and you would have thought there's absolutely no way that these small people could possibly 
do the task, you know, this task that no one else has been able to do, that everybody else has failed at, you know, the odds are just extraordinary. And of course, they're sent off and everybody thinks they're sent off to their, to their, um, you know, certain death. But the mere fact that they continue on this journey has a kind of ripple effect on, on all the societies around them. And they just get, they get lucky, they keep going, and they manage to make it work. And that's how I kind of see the climate struggle, which is that it's all very well to, to kind of down tools and, and stock up on canned goods. I, I cannot do that. I cannot look my children in the eye and say, oh, you know, I just gave up. But also by staying engaged and by everybody staying engaged, we do something about the odds that we can get through it and create a livable world for Jean and hopefully the children that maybe Jean wants to have one day if we do solve this problem. Jean, what do you, I, I want to, as we get towards the end of this, talk about more about this positive thing. So what are, you must be struck by this. So obviously I, this, this campaign, which has already had an impact, and I think it will have more of an impact, especially when we can all get outdoors and get together again. But there's also things that all of us can do. And what are the things that you think of that all of us can do that can make incremental difference when you add them all up? perhaps a bigger one. Mm. So um, I think that often when you discuss the sort of individualised action, people will think about keep cups and catching public transport and reducing their overall carbon footprint and changing their diet, which is all really great and important and we need to be making these sorts of lifestyle changes. But the biggest impact that you and as an individual can make is actually getting involved in organising and getting involved in a campaign. So whether it is putting up posters for some sort of event or, or you know, doing door knocking or phone banking or somehow getting involved in this organising, um, the amount of, say, carbon you're preventing from getting into the atmosphere and the, the sort of change you make in that way is far greater than what you as an individual by yourself can do. So in a way of making that sort of individual action is joining part of a collective and sort of taking that extra step beyond just attending protest, but becoming more involved and sort of becoming a sort of smaller activist or, or taking those extra steps. So actually that means really acting politically and that's even people who maybe have never thought of themselves as political. Totally, because really what's what's difficult about the climate crisis is that it's not, it shouldn't be a political issue. It's this problem facing humanity. It, it's one of the greatest we've ever seen. And everyone should be arguing about how best we get rid of it and how best we avert the impacts of it. it it's so absurd to consider that people are denying it or people are saying that we shouldn't be taking action against it and it's been turned into this left-wing right-wing issue which is so unfortunate and is really preventing action in many ways so i think that by taking action and looking at this as what should be a bipartisan issue and looking at it as a moral problem that you need to do something about because you are literally saving the world and you are you are helping avert this enormous issue by taking part in a small way um it's not just political it, it is it is far beyond that but yeah I, I think people who haven't been involved before or or maybe are nervous or intimidated by the idea of it um they're the people that need to be involved and, and can make such a great enormous difference if they sort of saw their potential and and sort of gain that confidence to to take part Rebecca, what, what about you? Because you 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 know you know about politics. <laughs> You've had some experience yeah. in the past, but but are, is ultimately what we have to do something political to make a real difference? Oh, oh look, we need the political system to act. Uh, often in a very often, you know, when people say that the market will do it all, they forget that in fact that it's governments that build grids, you know, it's governments that build infrastructure that allow things like renewable energy to work. It's governments that do things like tax one sector and then and provide incentives for the other and not the other. So government plays an extraordinary role. I do think that what we need to do now is, is because there are politicians that care deeply about this. Every other part of Australian society 
has to surround the political cars, support the people who are serious about this. And the only people that I want to be shamed in the climate change discussion are those people who are dragging their feet. So we need the insurance agencies and the big corporations and we need, you know, every single kind of community. We need farmers, we need children, we need parents. We need, you know, sporting associations. I mean, they're one of the things that I've really loved um, in in the last two years is is discovering extraordinary networks in civil society that care about climate. There's a veterinarians for climate group. There's an engineers and architects for climate group. And these are people who are genuinely thinking in our professional lives, what can we do to um, further the climate cause? So we what we need to do is surround the political caste and shame them or force them into action. We do that with our votes, but our vote is something that comes across, it comes along every couple of years. It's important, but it's not the only way we can we can bring about pressure on the system. Um, and again, like I said, we've got an extraordinary, uh, as citizens, we've got a great role to play to support people in the political system that really care about it, particularly those people on the conservative side of politics who where speaking out on climate can often mean that you're a bit of a target in your own political party for doing that. We've got to make sure that we support them as well. Yeah, actually, it was put to me in the course of making Hot Mess that that conservative environmentalists, conservatives who care about this issue and are prepared to talk about it and talk to people who trust them about it perhaps might be one of the most important groups of them all. I think that's absolutely right. So there's a, a really fantastic concept that I came across researching the book called The Importance of Climate Brokers. So these are people who aren't in the climate movement but might be religious leaders, they might be um, you know, third, fourth generation farmers, they might be people you would never have thought cared about climate but they, because of their standing in another community that's not associated with the environment and climate movement, when they speak out about climate from a position of trust in that community, they play an extraordinary role. So we, we do need to make sure that the climate movement is politically diverse, diverse in terms of ethnicity, race, all the rest of it, um, and and um, generation. But, in, but it's these people who are, I suppose, disrupting our perception of who cares about climate change that can play a mm. really important role as messengers. And, of course, people like young people like Jean as well. Jean, you, you've had such an impact so far. What is next? Yeah, I, I think that um, it's interesting to look at because the school strikes in particular have really opened the conversation about the climate crisis and they've brought it to the mainstream and they've mobilised young people so much. But often when we look back at the accomplishments of it, this is still happening. The, the climate crisis is still happening. We're still frightened. We're still angry. And politicians are continuing to sweep this issue under the rug. So I think it's a process of continuing to mobilise together and as a team continue working as a collective and finding ways to take action. Particularly now it's difficult in terms of the pandemic and we've had to evolve a lot. Yeah, I think it's just continuing to take action and continuing to speak out and doing everything that we can until we feel that we've averted this crisis and that we've won. I think it is too. And I want to thank both of you for joining me to have this conversation today. Thank you so much. And thanks, Jane, for your activism. <laughs> thanks so much for having me. Um, yeah, Rebecca, it was so interesting to hear about your research. I definitely got to read your book. And can I just add in there, thank you for creating such a wonderful discussion for the Inner West community today. We really appreciate each of you, Rebecca, Jean and Richard, for participating in this climate conversation for us, for the Footprints Online. No worries. Great. Thank you, guys. Awesome. Thanks so much. See ya. Stay with us for our ongoing program throughout the day. For more of the Footprints online program and digital content from the Inner West Council, go to our website.